This is Unsilo, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Uh, welcome to Unsilo. This is uh, Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with, with Tom Wheeler, who is currently at the Brookings Institute um, as a uh, visiting fellow. Uh, he's also the author of, of a number of books. Um, the latest is called From Gutenberg to Google, The History of Our Future. Also got a couple other books, uh, including this one, Leadership Lessons from the Civil War, which I think actually came out of this one, Mr. Lincoln's T-Mails. I, can't, I don't know the order that you did it, it in. Was, but it, the, was the other, the, it was actually the other way around. Ah, it okay. Was, Lincoln's T-Mails followed Leadership Lessons. Yeah, and, and, and Lincoln's T-Mails, actually, you, it, you make reference to the T-Mails in the, the Gutenberg book because we right. talk about how Lincoln was the first online uh, president. Um, and you also have a new book coming out, uh, which, um, unfortunately, I didn't get a copy of this yet, but it's, um, what is it? The good, tell me the title of the new book. It's called, it's called Techlash, colon, Who Makes the Rules in the New Gilded Age? And uh, as you've seen by the other books, what I love to do is to relate the experiences of history with the ex- with what's going on today, and uh, and it is the story of um, the uh, industrial barons and the internet barons, and <laughs> how we dealt with the former and how we should deal with the latter. Right, and this book, uh, the most recent book, uh, from Gutenberg to Google, is also. It's a book of history, but it also ties it together to the present. And, and I should mention also that prior to or concurrent with writing uh, your books, you have served in a number of capacities as, as an executive, as uh, the leader of a bunch of different trade associations, and also as um, chairman of the uh, Federal Communication Commission. So industry experience, government experience, and uh, I guess authorial slash almost academic experience. You bring a lot to the table. Thanks for joining me, Tom. Greg, it's great to be with you. Thanks for asking me. Okay, so in this book uh, from Gutenberg uh, to Google, you you highlight sort of three, I guess we'd call them information revolutions, or I guess you call them more like network evolutions. And I I hadn't actually thought of uh, the, the kind of printing press as launching a network revolution. And I hadn't really thought of the, the, the railroad as launching a, a network uh, revolution, although the telegraph piece, you know, makes m- more sense. But, but you, so even though you're emphasizing the continuity of these, these different revolutions, um, you say that the most recent one, the internet, or computation plus telecommunication, this new network revolution is 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 different in in a fundamental way in that it's um decentralized instead of of centralized so so i guess you know we could talk about the continuity parts or we could talk about the discontinuity uh uh, parts but but how did you get the idea for this this kind of sequence of events as a as a unified theme well you know greg uh, i'm you know i'm a network guy i've been in telecom for most of my life um, and um, and tend to see things in terms of the structures that connect us are the structures that define us. And um, and so I started going back uh, and and thinking about this. Yes, obviously in the telegraph, telephone, internet, we can we can make those fit. But I said, well, wait a minute, you know, the the original information revolution was the printing press and it was a network because what happened was it was only a handful of years after Gutenberg's uh, uh, discovery uh, or perfection of movable type that there developed throughout Europe small local print shops that basically reprinted what other print shops had done and became a network, much like the early days of computers when you would literally carry floppy disks from one computer to another, what we used to call a sneaker net, right? And here this was happening in the 15th century. 
And so, um, and I was fascinated by the effects of of this. Um, you know, there there would not have been the Reformation absent the distribution network of um, the of the printing press. And and Gutenberg, um, I, I, I'm sorry, Luther. Um, understood the power of this network and took advantage of it. And then there's an example that at, at roughly the same time, there was this craziness going on in northern Italy that we've come to call the Renaissance, and and it would have remained isolated in northern Italy, or at least taking taken an awful long time to spread, um, had it not been for the ability to uh, of the book uh, and inexpensive printing to spread the ideas, and then of course to create what networks do, what you and I are doing right now on this network, which is dialogue which is somebody produces something, it's printed in a book, it, it, it goes hundreds of miles away, it gets exposed and somebody else says, no, that's not right, and they print something and it goes back the other direction. And, and so the, the ideas that became the scientific method of, of hey, here's a, here's a concept, now let's challenge it and, and debate it, um, uh, began with the printing press and the network that it reflected. Um, and, and so that was my kind of aha moment. Um, and then the railroad comes in in terms of it was the first high speed network that everything up until the railroad had been determined by geography and animal stamina. Um, how far could you go uh, before you or your steed uh, collapsed? And, um, and all of a sudden, the iron horse comes along and doesn't have any of those limitations and introduces not only distance, but speed. And 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 the and it also introduced the centralization of those networks, where where you come to a central point in order to be switched out to other points, which is the same structure then that we used for the telegraph, the same structure we used for the telephone, and the structure that's been destroyed by the internet. And so my theory was: look at how. Economic activity, inquiry, discovery, all followed the patterns of the dominant networks of their era, from distributed to centralized by printing, to centralized by uh, railroads, to centralized by uh, telegraph and telephone, to distributed again in the new internet economy. Well, you know, I was reading the section about the, the origins of the, of the printing press. Um, you, you know, there were so many similarities between what was happening then and how people responded to it and kind of what's, what's happening today, right, or in the last, right. you know, 20 years. Um, and, you know, you always hear people talk about how more data has been created in the last 12 months <laughs> yeah. than was right. created, you know, in, in the entire human history up till the year 2000. But, but the same thing was true then. I mean, they had more documents or manuscripts created in the 50 years after the printing press than you saw in the previous thousand years. And, and, and this, you know, led to a lot of fear and resistance and, and, and pushback. And, and I love how you, you referenced, there was this one, um, there was this one book, what was it? In defense of the scribe or something, yeah, in praise right. of, the, of, of scribes. scribes. And, and it kind of reminded me about how, yeah, like, you know, people say, oh man, the, everything's boiled down to, you know, 106, 40 characters and Twitter. And, you know, it seems like they were, they're kind of making the same case back then for yeah, but the great uh, thing know, was, doing it the, the old fashioned way. The book in praise of scribes 
talks about how important it is, the great contributions that these monks sitting on those benches laboring away to copy books. And what did the author do? He had it printed. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I think people... That's right. You want to bemoan the impacts of Twitter on Twitter, right? That's yeah, right. What... Exactly. I mean, it was a classic example. Right. And and then so so the when you're talking about this the way information got disseminated, sort of post post printing press, it, you you talk about kind of these centralized hubs and then these sort of I guess um, sort of. I don't know auxiliary hubs. Is, is, so, would is, is it sort of information would be generated someplace, and then it would, I guess, it would get transported physically to some other right. remote manufacturing facility, where it would then, you know, start right. repopulating that locality. Is that sort of how you think about it? Yeah, well, it's, it's actually that 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 we have. They were um, decentralized hubs. Okay, that you, you you started out okay. with an environment where it were where all of the information creation was highly distributed and seldom knew of each other. Then along comes the printing press, which allows for a centralization of activity, but does it on a decentralized basis, if you will. So that, that, that you've got this in Heidelberg, you've got this in Hamburg, you've got this in Paris, uh, where they're all doing their, their printing activities. Uh, and then along comes the railroad, which totally centralizes everything because you have to bring it to a point and switch it out, uh, which becomes the model until the Internet. Mm-hmm. Now, when you talk about the railroads, because you talk about the railroads and the telegraph as sort of complementary innovations but but they they didn't happen they didn't happen simultaneously right so what i found fascinating was how you described the problem that the railroads had particularly the single track railroads right and how they you know in order to avoid collisions right they 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 really had to operate at relatively low capacity on these on these networks right yeah they had to operate at low capacity and um and 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 cut back their their speed. They so 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 rule number one. Um, since you're going, let's just say east and west on a on an east west line, there's a there's a train going east and a train going west on the same track. The way they would handle things is they would have sidings so that one would pull over and the other would pass. But Murphy's law, of course, said, "Oh no." There were, you know, there there were sheep on the track or whatever that slowed one of them down and they couldn't get there, and and, and the wonderful story of of this is um, is a, a guy by the name of Charles Minot um, who was um, uh, a supervisor on the Erie Railroad um, in the eighteen fifties, and um, and he was. Um, I guess today we would say that he was driven, uh, and um, he 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 was uh, push 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 kind of a guy. And he was on um, one of the Erie trains, um, and and he um, passed a station where the other train was supposed to be waiting for them. The other, the other train going the other direction. And um, and it it wasn't there, and so the engineer says, "Well, I'm going to stop and wait." And Minot says, "No, no, no, we got to move on. We got to push." And uh, and the engineer says, "Uh, uh-uh, uh, man, <laughs> you know, this is Casey Jones and the two trains colliding." And um, and so Minot goes into the station because the railroads had been smart enough to say that you would string the, they, they would give the rights away along the track to string the cable. So he goes into the station and he telegraphs the next station. <clears throat> and he says, has the eastbound passed you yet? And they respond, no. He says, well, hold it up. And, um, and the, goes back and tells the engineer, okay, we can go on to the next station. And the engineer says, no way, buddy. <laughs> I'm not doing this. Because I know what, what's going to happen, and I'm not going to trust sparks on a wire um, with to determine what happens to my my train and my life. 
And, uh, and so Minot said to him, okay, I'll drive the train. So he gets in the cab and the engineer goes to the last row in the last car of the train. He is so convinced that, they, that they're heading into another train going the opposite direction. They get to the next station, nothing happens. Minot goes in, he telegraphs the next station, the train hasn't left there, he gives them the same instruction, and that was the first implementation of how uh, the telegraph then got used to schedule the, uh, the railroad. And the point here is that you had the railroad, which I, which I refer to in from Gutenberg to Google as, as the first high-speed network. And you then had to manage it by an even higher speed network. And, and that was the telegraph. And that then introduced the ability, the concept and the ability to manage things from afar, which if the railroad, the centralization of the railroad allowed the low cost transportation of high volume, high weight, low value products like coal or corn, um, to be transported for great distances, which they weren't able to economically um, before, and that allowed for mass production, and then the telegraph allowed for the coordination of supply and demand, mm -hmm. and ultimately the coordination of multiple production facilities so that you have the first corporate entities, uh, not just single uh, operations, mm -hmm. but you have um, you have multiple activities owned by one corporate entity managed from afar because of the telegraph. No, I, I mean, I think it was Alfred Chandler who, who said that, right, it was the telegraph that enabled the, the modern corporation, right? right? So you can, right. you know... You don't have to rely entirely on local decision making based on local signals, but rather you can kind of aggregate all that information to a central command center and then, you know, dispatch orders. But, but you know, he talks about the, you know, GM and DuPont and the railroads, but, but really it, it was the U.S. military that, that seems to be the first organization that really – well, it, began to leverage these, these, uh, these technologies, right? Yeah, Greg, I mean, it's a great – point that that so so building the railroad let alone running the railroad were the greatest management feats ever undertaken in scope and scale at that point in time and and i mean i mean imagine the challenge of building a railroad all of the men you have to coordinate, all of the logistics and material that you've got to make sure come to the right place at the right time, and 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 all of this sort of thing. And so, so the the early railroad pioneers looked around and said, "Gee, who has any experience in 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 logistics and masses of men? Oh, it's the army." Right. And so they started hiring uh, army officers, and and I think I say in the book that there were about 120 West Point graduates that ended up being officials in American railroads, um, and 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 brought along with them obviously men who had served with them and also thought the, thought the same way. But the thing that I find fascinating is. The structure that got put in place was the same kind of structure that the military had. We, yeah. I, I get a big kick out of the fact that t even today we talk about 
well, there's this division or that division of a corporation. Mm -hmm. Where did the term division come from? It was brought by these West Pointers and first put in place in building and running the railroads Mm -hmm. and became a corporate staple. Right, but McClellan was a railroad executive who who was the first commander of Union forces during the Civil War, and and you know he he it seems as if he did not take full advantage of the the technology, and perhaps it's because in the railroad business you know speed was not of the essence, whereas in in the military context being able to respond very very quickly is is critical, and I think in in your book. Uh, that's a point that you make repeatedly in kind of uh, leadership lessons. And I, and I guess, we could, you know, run, we could running a business. We could talk about McClellan forever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, there are two things about McClellan. Yes, you're right. He was, he was, a, he became a railroad uh, uh, executive. But there was something um, else that, what, what made McClellan was the telegraph. And um, as a young captain, recent graduate from West Point, he was sent by the U.S. Army to observe the Crimean War. And, um, and he saw there the telegraph being used for the first time. Um, it was basically to send information back. Here's what's been going on. It wasn't any great logistic operate, but it was being used. And, and he's going, wow, this is really, you know, thinking away, this is something really interesting. So, so when he finally um, ends up, you said he was the first uh, uh, general of the U- Union Army. Actually, he wasn't. Um, he was, he started, he, he, his claim to fame was in, in, Early in the Civil War, in Western Virginia, the area now is West Virginia, but in Western Virginia, he fought with a Confederate commander by the name of Robert E. Lee. Both of them were kind of, they had, you know, they were generals, they had their own uh, 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 forces and responsibilities, uh, and, um, but were kind of out off the beaten path, which was the path between Washington and Richmond. And, um, and McClellan brought the telegraph with him as he advanced. He, he was famous for writing letters to his wife um, which were preserved, which are amazing letters. I mean, this is a man of monumental ego and narcissism, but, but he, in one of his letters, he says, for the first time in history, the telegraph has advanced with an army. And, um, and, and he would use that not only to, to communicate back to his command, but also the members of the press who were following him Hey, if you guys would like to use the telegraph to send your dispatches, go ahead, be my guest. And so George McClellan, in a in a in a few sm- small battles, but battles that he won in Western Virginia, became a national figure because the reporters traveling with him mm-hmm. used the telegraph to tell his story. Kind of like Julius Caesar sent back uh, his. Uh Gallic War uh, memos back to Rome, <laughs> boosting exactly, his case. Exactly, but, but it took a few days, for weeks, for uh, for Caesar's memos to uh-huh. come back, and this was almost real time reporting, and it made right. McClellan a giant. Uh-huh. And so, when Lincoln is looking around after First Manassas, what should I be doing? Um, and McClellan is the obvious uh, first choice. Um, and and when McClellan comes to Washington, he centralizes all of the telegraph lines in his office. Not the War Department, not the White House, but his office. And he actually gives instructions to his aide, Thomas Eckert, um, 
that he is not to share any information that comes in over the telegraph with the President of the United States unless McClellan personally approves it. And the classic example of that was uh, after the Battle of Ball's Bluff in October of 62, um, uh, 61, sorry, um, uh, at which, which was another Union defeat, at which Lincoln's best friend was killed, Edward Baker. Lincoln's, Lincoln had named his son, uh, who, who died in Springfield, Edward Baker Lincoln. Um, and, um, and it, was a, it was a loss for the Union um, at Ball's Bluff. It was a loss, terrible personal loss, for Lincoln of his best friend. McClellan was meeting with Lincoln at the White House and um, an aide comes in and hands him the message, the telegraph, telegram. And McClellan reads it, folds it up, and puts it in his pocket. And never says to the President of the United States, who is sitting right there across from him, that these two tragedies have happened. And then he leaves. And Lincoln, who was famous for what we would today call management by walking around, mm -hmm. um, um, wandered over to McClellan's headquarters, which was on the, were on the other side of, of Lafayette Square, across from the White House, later that day. And um, and Eckert, who was McClellan's aide, um, and had been instructed not to share anything without permission, saw Lincoln coming and he took the telegram and he hid it under his blotter. Mm. And Lincoln comes and says, well, Eckert, anything new? To which Eckert says, there's nothing new in the file, sir. <laughs> and McClellan was not in his office. And Lincoln wanders into his office and he sees there on McClellan's desk the document that McClellan would not share with him when it was face to face, talking about the loss of the battle and the loss of his best friend. Mm -hmm. And he comes out and he confronts Eckert. And, and he says, I asked you if there's anything new. Look at this. And he says, and Eckert replies, sir, I responded, there is nothing new in the file. And Eckert pulls out a copy from under his blotter and says, I put my copy under here because I've been instructed not to share this with you. And this was a classic example of Lincoln learning that he who controls the conduit controls the content, which is something very true today. And, um, and it was shortly thereafter um, that uh, the U.S. military telephone, the U.S. military telegraph corps was created, which may have had military in its name, but did not report to any military officer it reported to the Secretary of War, who reported to the President of the United States, and all the wires were moved into the Secretary of War's office, uh, except for those that were absolutely necess a necessity for McClellan. And that became the hub of activity. Yeah, I mean, that's such a classic story about organizational politics, but it also speaks to kind of Lincoln's um, managerial style and, and real, you know, excellence. And you talk a bit in the, in the book about um, Mr. Lincoln's T-mails and, and about how he would, well, not simply by walking around, but also by establishing kind of lines of, of communication that uh, with with the people out in, in the field, right? Um, I was wondering if you could talk, talk a bit about that because that, that, is, that seems to be a way of, of, I don't know, you know, getting around the, the, the hub and spoke uh, approach to information gathering. Yep. Well, the, the, the reason that I wrote Mr. Lincoln's T-mails is that the telegrams 
roughly a thousand telegrams that he sent during his presidency, um, have always been footnote fodder in various stories about the Civil War. But but I felt they told a story and how Lincoln used them told a story. And what was fascinating was that here was a man who w had a new technology that had never been used this way. And he had to figure out how to use it. And he had to figure that out. There wasn't exactly a textbook or Professor LeBlanc's class that he could go sit in and learn no, no, about No YouTube it. videos. There were no YouTube videos. And, um, and, and he had to figure it out in the middle of a civil war. And I talk in the book about how he went through three phases. In the first phase, it really, he didn't pay that much of, uh, attention. He used it as a, um, as a, a way of projecting his, his... Well, the first phase, he didn't pay much attention. The second phase... He used it as a way of projecting his voice. You will do this. You will do that. And then he realized that the real secret of the telegraph was what it revealed was going on in the field. And so he would go over to the telegraph office, which was in the War Department, which was next door to the White House. He spent more time there than any other place other than the White House uh, itself. Um, and he would go through and he would read the flimsies, the copies of the telegrams that had come in from the field to understand what was going on. And, um, and that gave him something that no political leader had ever had before, and that was a window into what was going on in his general's tents. I mean, you know, Napoleon went with his troops because the leader had to be there to see what was going on. Um, Henry was at Agincourt because the leader had to be there. Um, and, um, and Lincoln was the first political leader who was able to manage from afar because this technology gave him insight not only into the um, the what's going on in the tents, but also what's going on in the heads of his commanders, and he would engage with them, um, even though they hadn't directly addressed him. He would, in essence, say, "Hey, I see that you said this in this telegram. Listen, here are my thoughts." And and they are some great classic leadership lessons. I mean, my favorite is that when Grant was down outside of, of, uh, of, of Petersburg um, in 64 and 65 and, and, and um, was kind of worried about what was going on with the draft riots and were they going to be taking troops away from him. And, and he sent a letter to Halleck, who was then the Army Chief of Staff, um, an email to him or a text <laughs> Let me get this straight. A telegram to him. Uh, and, he, and he said, um, kind of, hey, boss, how am I doing? And Lincoln saw this. And Lincoln picks up a pen and he jots off a line that says, hold on with a bulldog grip and chew and choke as much as possible. And when Grant, Grant was at a city point and he, he gets this, this telegram and his his uh, his telegraph operator hands it transcribe it and hands it to him, and he looks at the people uh, in the room and he says to the uh, something to the effect that that man has more courage than any of those around him, mm. and Lincoln used the telegraph to convey that kind of decisiveness, that kind of courage, that kind of leadership. And, and so the conclusion that I reach in Mr. Lincoln's T-mails is that Abraham Lincoln thereby invented um, the modern electronic leadership paradigm, which is listen, 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 and respond when necessary. And, and I think the, the key insight behind the telegraph is that it separates, as you say, separates information from physical delivery, right? So you no longer have to have sort of a, 
uh, messenger, you know, traveling on foot or horse. And right. so that's really the, the key discontinuity that leads us into the digital, the digital era. Yes. Yes. Now this guy, uh, yeah. this guy, this guy Morse seems like an interesting character, right? And I remember reading about him when I was a kid, right? I remember when I was in third grade, there was a wall of about a thousand biographies, uh, these short biographies of famous people. And he was one of them. And, yep. you know, when I was reminded that he was an art professor, that I, yep. I totally had forgotten that small detail. Like, how does an art professor become one of the most important technological innovators of, art, of, of modern times? Uh, by theft. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, when you get right down to it, you know, everybody gives Morris credit for inventing the, the telegraph. But really, um, and, and this was in part because the telegraph didn't exist. And again, mm -hmm. uh, how you understand what everybody else is, is, is doing didn't exist. But, um, but the, the, the challenge, well, there's, there, there are two things that Morris gets credit for that were not his, um, including Morse code, which is the second one we'll talk about in a second. The first was the, the challenge of telegraphy is the physics of sending an electronic pulse mm -hmm. down a wire, and, and which, which what happens is that it attenuates. The friction yeah. means it gets weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. And so, yeah, you could have telegraphs going over short distances or things like this, um, but uh, but you never, um, but you couldn't couldn't have the long distance that was necessary, and and Morris met with a guy by the name of Joseph Henry, and Joseph Henry ended up back to Abraham Lincoln ended up kind of being like Lincoln's scientific advisor. He was the first uh, secretary of the Smithsonian Institution um, uh, during the during the war. He was Lincoln's scientific advisor, and and Henry had developed a repeater, what we would call today an amplifier, um, where you would the the signal would get down to just as weak as it could still be read, and he would put another battery there and another unit so that it would the, it would it would click the key, if you will that would be powered by a new battery and then sent on. And, um, and Henry was one of these guys who felt that you didn't patent things because you were doing this for the good of science and the good of mankind. Well, that didn't slow Morris down, okay? So he swipes, he swipes Henry's idea um, and, uh, and it's his huge breakthrough, um, that he patents, claims for his own, um, et cetera. So Morse um, is kind of like, Morse is kind of like a 19th century Steve Jobs, right? <laughs> Cause he's another artist who, uh, who was pretty good at stealing some, some ideas that were, you know, originated elsewhere. It came out of the park and elsewhere. Yes. The, yeah. the, the, but the other thing that he did was he had this, he had this assistant by the name of Alfred Vail. Mm -hmm. Morris's idea. So, so first of all, so so Morris swipes Henry's idea and um and gets to uh, and solves the the long distance problem. But Morris's concept was that he would send a number, which yeah. you would then look up in a dictionary, and you'd <laughs> go number three sixty seven. Oh, that's yeah. Wednesday. And um, and it was incredibly cumbersome kind of of a process, and um, and his assistant Alfred Vale kept noticing that um, you could hear the taps and and figure out what was what was going on, and is there a way that you can break the message down into its smallest units? Rather than saying Wednesday, but W-E-D, okay? And how do you do that? And so he went to a print shop, back to Gutenberg. He went to a print shop, 
and literally went through the printer's type chest mm -hmm. and counted the number of copies of each individual letter that the printer was using, figuring that, well, the easiest signal needs to be the one that the printer uses the most. That happens to be the letter E. And so E is one dot. And he goes on from there as they become as the let as the letters become less frequent, the code becomes more complex, um, and um, and he brings this back to Morris, and this becomes Morris code. No, it's not Morris code. It's just another thing that he ripped off. Um, but. Uh, but it's one of the wonderful things about history, and you're right, drawing the analogies to today, uh, that um, that it's not always the person whose name uh, gets on uh, the discovery that actually is the key to why it happened. And, and the stories like that are fascinating. Well, there's another story you have of this guy named uh, Antenis, Antenisov, who I, I had never heard of, right? And he yeah. also was an originator. Now, I, I went to University of Pennsylvania, so the, the ENIAC is, yeah, right. you know, ever, well, that's the celebrated, you know, birth of the yeah. of the modern uh, computer. And, and I had no idea that, that, that actually this was built on something which happened in uh, Ames, Iowa. Ames, right? Iowa. Right, of all and, places. Um, they are careful now. You're talking, my wife went to the university, or went to Iowa State University, um, uh, I've I have been uh, to the physics lab where Atanasov built uh, the, uh, the the first computer. So uh, fascinating thing was that, that John Vincent Atanasov um, uh, was um, a physics professor at Iowa State uh, University. He was playing around with this ideas of how do you harness electronics digitally, because computing had been done still on an analog basis, um, and, and, um, and electronic tubes, which were on, off, on, off, oh my goodness, that's like the telegraph, right, dot, dash, dot, mm -hmm. dash, and, and can, you, can you take that on, off capability in an electronic tube and, um, and, and use it for digital calculations. And, and one night, um, and Tanisov uh, and, uh, was, went back to his office on campus after, um, after dinner at home, and he was playing with this idea, and he couldn't get anywhere, and he, he had just bought a new car. And um, like so many of us, um, we get in the car and different parts of our brain start working as we're driving along, right? And so he goes out and he starts driving east and he turns on, for, for those of you who listen to this who are from Ames, he turned left onto Lincoln Highway and started driving east towards Illinois. And, um, and he crossed the river. And the interesting thing about crossing the river to get from Iowa into Illinois is that Iowa was dry and Illinois wasn't. And so Tanisov pulls in to the first roadhouse across the river in Illinois, pulls up in a corner, orders a drink, and sits there and sketches out his idea on a cocktail napkin. I mean, it's, it's, it's like fiction. Mm -hmm. um, he goes back and he builds uh, what was called the ABC, the Tanisov Barry, because his graduate assistant was named Barry Computer. And it was the first digital electronic computer. And it was a gigantic thing uh, in the basement of the physics hall uh, at Iowa State University. And he goes to... Um, a conference of uh, of other professors, uh, um, and and uh, he meets a guy by the name of Mockley from your alma mater, um, and they're talking about this, and and Mockley, wow, that's really interesting. 
And Mockley, as you indicated, was busy um, with federal government money trying to build something at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and um, and Mockley says, gee, can I come out and visit? And you got to stop and think. This was the early 40s, right? And a car trip from Philadelphia to Ames, Iowa, was a major undertaking. And Mockley gets in his car and he drives over there. And Atenasoff, being this wonderful Midwestern um, innocent, um, puts him up in his house, gives him a bed, gives him food. He eats with his family. And Mockley walks out with everything that Atenasoff has done, turns around, does it himself, uh, gets uh, the credit for it. Ends, uh, it ends up becoming ENIAC, which becomes uh, 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 UNIVAC, which uh, goes on. And 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 poor and Atanasov then gets called into the war effort. He works in the Navy Department. He's doing all kinds of important things. But the idea just kind of peters away, and Mockley is off doing his uh, his self promotion on this until in the 1960s. Um, there was the, the successor the, to, to, to um, Uni, Univac, eventually became Sperry Rand, and, um, and they were demanding royalties from everybody who would build an electronic computer. And finally, one of the companies sued them and said, no, you don't have the rights to this. It's Honeywell, right? Yeah, uh, Honeywell. A and... Um, and the trial goes, it happens in Minnesota, and Atanasoff testifies, and they produce all these documents that shows that, you know, no, Mockley didn't invent this. And, and, and the court rules that it was John Vincent Atanasoff who was the father of the modern uh, digital electronic computer, and that ruling happened the same day as Nixon's Saturday Night Massacre. <laughs> and so once again, Denisov was wiped away by the events of the day that there should have been headlines saying, Father of the Computer Discovered. And unfortunately, he doesn't get any, uh, any credit. Uh, and so one of the things that I really enjoyed doing was telling that story and trying to get people like you than uh, to to see this uh, this wonderful story and repeat it like you just did. Now, before we get to the the current moment, it, it seems like there's a, there's a trend uh, that we whenever there's any kind of technological evolution, it, it's going to disrupt uh, vested interests, right? There's going to be folks who uh, are, are going to be you know upset by this innovation, um, yes. and they're also ones that you know probably were in a position to innovate themselves, but didn't really have the incentives to innovate. And so you, you talk about the kind of conflict between Western Union and, 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 uh, and, and Bell, which became at and 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 how, you know, Western Union could very well have been the one that developed all the telephone networks, but, they, you know, they, 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 they didn't. Um, and then later you talk about how, you know, Bell Labs and at and they could have been the ones that really spearheaded the Internet, but, but you know, they didn't. Right. And they didn't see any real benefit to this. So. So, I mean, is there something about innovation where innovation has to come from from new yes. players? Right. Yes, absolutely. Because because you innovate. I mean, I mean we're having this debate right now. Um, there is a contingent um, in uh, national policy. Uh, saying that we need to make sure that um, our dominant digital platforms, Google, Facebook, uh, Amazon, etc., remain dominant because they're the ones who were doing the great breakthroughs um, in terms th that are going to allow us to keep pace with all of the managed development that's coming out of China. Um, and uh, and I think history teaches just the opposite lesson that that and I have the most respect for these companies Google Facebook Amazon etc but 
their fiduciary responsibility is to invest money that will do things to make more money for their shareholders, Mm -hmm. not to go out on wild and crazy things that will invest, that that might have a thing. I mean, we're seeing this with chat GPT right now, right? Um, And, and, and open AI, um, that didn't come out of, uh, out of, uh, out of these companies. Mm -hmm. Um, And, um, and the, 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 Fiduciary responsibility is to do things that would that that will return for their shareholders, um, and that means that even though something is um, an important development, you sit on it. Let me tell you two quick stories in that regard. I was I was blessed in my life, and blessed is the word, to know Paul Barron who was the father of packet switching, and to learn from Paul Barron the rudiments of digital concepts. I mean, what a blessing. And Paul told me one night about about when he took the idea to Mm AT&T. And first of all, they didn't understand what he was talking about because he was talking about a constant on and off where his telephone networks were always on. And and so he got they they brought somebody over from Bell Labs, who understood digital concepts as kind of a translator. And Paul said I might as well have been speaking Swahili to them, um, and um, and and the light bulb goes off, and and AT and T says, "Whoa, this is a threat to our business." The Defense Department came in and said, "We will pay you." to build this digital network. And at and goes, no way, we're not going to build something that could end up competing with us. Okay, first story. Second story. There was a man at, 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 at Bell Labs, which probably had more IQ per square foot than any other place on the planet, owned by AT&T. Um, and he developed a thing called magnetic tape and we go gee magnetic tape my god you know we've that's been around forever and he answering machine you can have an answering machine (laughs) this is the point so we so so he shows it to his bosses at AT at&t here's what we can do we can have a device that will answer your phone when you're not there and you can leave a message and the guys at ATD go, no way, no, no, that's going to cut down on telephone usage. People won't make as many calls to keep calling back. And they killed it. And as you know, magnetic tape was not just for answering machines, and it became key to computing, storage, and all of this, all of this sort of thing. But, but the reality is that the incentive is to hoard something to protect the hoard new ideas to protect against mm-hmm. encroachment in the business that is producing your bottom line. And that's, it's human nature, it's basic economics, and it's why we have to make sure that there is always an entrepreneurial initiative that is encouraged and funded to, 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 to push the edges of the envelope because it won't come from the establishment. Well, now you've been in a position as a regulator and, you know, the, the regulators, I mean, they have, cons- their, their main constituents are the, the incumbents, right? They're the folks that right. already exist, right? And, and the, the, they, they can't really kind of solicit information from the, the companies that, that don't exist. So how can, how can regulators... Uh, avoid being just captured by the the incumbents by the the vested interests i mean if if they're really the only folks that they have an opportunity to speak with and and listen to how can a regu- how can regulators kind of stay ahead and and maintain the environment which will allow for continued continuous disruption uh, years ago i learned to fly and my flying instructor kept telling me, Tom, get your head out of the cockpit because you want to just look at the dials um, and you better be aware of the environment around you. Um, And regulators need to get their head out of the cockpit. 
Um, and the trap that you fall into, that is easy to fall into, is to rely on the incumbents and those that they fund, because the the the, the, the current technique is you is that the incumbents fund quote independent groups um, uh, to 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 keep feeding information into the regulators and into the public media and into Congress. Um, and you've got to get your head out of the cockpit and have an understanding of what's going on, um, or at least be seeking what is going on, um, because the source of information, the principal source of information, should not be um, the body or the, the group that will be the beneficiary uh, or be affected by the policy decision that you make. Now you've run, uh, I think, two of those those groups, right? So I think w- Correct. Ob- Obama said you were the the Bo Jackson of uh, te- te- of <laughs> telecoms, I guess, because you you were kind of running the the cable trade association and the and the wireless. Uh, now those those two groups don't always see eye to eye, right? So I mean, how can one be <laughs> comfortable, you know, running different organizations? And and while you're in that role, I mean, you 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 have a front row seat to the kind of of lobbying that that industries can do to to kind of slow right. things down right 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 i was you know so i was asked this question during my confirmation hearing by a, a member of the senate who said to me uh, you know mr wheeler you have uh, you have represented these industries that you're now going to be charged with regulating um i mean how do you reconcile that and and i said senator um i hope that when I was representing the cable industry and the wireless industry, that I was the best possible representative that they could have for their issues. But if confirmed, my clients are not going to be the companies. They're going to be the people. It's going to be the people of the United States. And I want to be the best possible advocate for them. And, um, and I, I, you know, I really felt that. Um, and I tried to follow through um, uh, on on that, uh, which meant that um, um, you didn't always um, that you looked elsewhere for information, not just from those who you were regulating. Now, what's different about the? So we talked about the continuities, but but there really is a discontinuity, right, with this third network. Uh, revolution and and of course it it's about the way the network is architected and and you alluded to that with ARPANET and and the and the internet but the, it's not just that the network is is decentralized but it's also that uh, these networks don't simply communicate information but they they generate information in 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 the process right so i mean what what is new what 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 can we what do what can we not learn from the previous revolutions? Well, let's put it the other way. What can we learn? Um, and I, I think that the big takeaway of from Gutenberg to Google is um, is is that those who succeeded were those who embraced rather than fought the new technologies. Um, and I tell stories on on both sides uh, of, of of all three, and and the ones who fought were never the ones who won. Um, the other is that um, I think that our challenge today. Let's just take the issue of misinformation. You know, and you know. Lies, hate, and misinformation getting spread by the internet. Um, and companies like Google, YouTube, Facebook, Meta, and others making billions of dollars, profiting off of the spread of lies, hate, and misinformation. I know that you have had my Brookings colleague, Jonathan Rausch, on here talking to about uh, about his book, um, the Democracy of Knowledge, um, and and he tells a wonderful story in that book um, that I think is applicable today. That I 
replay in my forthcoming book, Tech Clash, um, in which he talks about, you know, we had a period that was in which the journalism was so bad that we actually named the period Yellow Journalism, where guys like Pulitzer and Hertz, Hearst um, um, would make up stories just to sell papers. It's kind of like, <laughs> all right, what we're seeing right now. How did that come to an end? It came to an end because in 1922, newspaper editors working for these guys formed the American Society of Newspaper Editors. And in 1923, they um, came up with a code of ethics for newspaper business. And the first item in the code of ethics was truth. And that was the beginning of the downfall of yellow journalism. Now, the difference here was that these were men, and they were men. These were men of conscience. They were biting the hand that fed them, literally. Recognizing their responsibility as the purveyors of information to the American people. Algorithms don't have consciences. <laughs> and, um, and the people who write the algorithms can't track what they're doing either. And so what we need to do and what TechLash, who makes the rules for the new Gilded Age, talks about is how do we come up with a new approach to code? to a kind of code that says, this is what you do to be responsible. A standard that people can be held to. And I think that there are ways that even though, uh, that, that, that protect the First Amendment and allow for enforcement of the code. And, um, and that that's the kind of thinking that we need to be bringing to today's problems. And so... To your point, we are definitely informed by the experiences of history. If we can go and find those lessons, draw the analogies, and it's not, as, as I say in the book, it, it's, not, it's not a cake mix. It's not you add a little to this and add some water to that and suddenly you've got an angel food cake. It's, it's not that you copy it directly, but you say, Ah, we're not the first people to have ever seen this. You know, Napoleon used to tell, I write about this in the, in the first book, Leadership Lessons from the Civil War. Napoleon used to tell his generals, study the campaigns of the past. You know, it, it wasn't so that you will do the same thing. It was that so you internalize those experiences. So when your leadership moment comes, you can say, aha. I've got to approach. And, and I think that that's what's lacking right now in our discussion of what has been created by this third network revolution. Now, I think the Wall Street Journal did a survey a while back and asked people, in order to become more innovative, what's the one topic you should study? And the number one answer was, was history. And, you know, I, I love referencing that as an historian, but it was also, I think, very surprising to people who are not historians, right? When we teach business, we use the case method, and the case method is really uh, sort of a, an historical uh, right. approach. And so I've always been intrigued by executives that tell me they read a lot of history. So do, do you think, I mean, if you were to advise executives to, to better prepare for the future, you know, would you tell them to read more history? And if so, what kind of history, right? Is, and you, 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 you read a lot of military <laughs> history. Are, are, is military history particularly useful f f as for it to be a senior leader? Um, you have really hit on a, on a hot button here, Professor. Um, I, I was a 
business major uh, in in college. I went to graduate school in business, and I uh, did not learn arts and letters. And it was my loss. Um, and um, and so um, philosophy, history, definitely you need to uh, understand um, those and they contribute to your understanding of today. Um, and um, you asked a question about military history. Um, what fascinates me about, about military history um, is the leadership moment when you have a clear-cut decision, you have clear-cut winners and losers, and it happens in the public eye. So you can learn from it. And um, uh, they, they, um, well, and, and I, I, so I, I, I think that philosophy and history are what I wished I had spent my misspent youth <laughs> worrying about, learning about. Well, Tom, it's been great chatting with you. We barely scratched the surface. Uh, one of the topics that I really found enjoyable in the book is when you describe the various innovations that were necessary before the printing press could get off the ground. I, I did not realize right. how, how complicated it was. <laughs> and I was talking to an artist friend of mine yesterday about you know, how the, you needed to have a special type of ink even in order for, for it to work. So lots of fun facts and interesting insight in all of these books, uh, most recently from Gutenberg to Google, and of course, the, the new book, which is called Tech Lash. Colon. Tech Lash. Who makes who makes the rules in the new Gilded Age? Right. Thanks so much, Tom. Hope to talk to you again soon, perhaps in person. Greg, thanks a lot. I really enjoyed it. Enjoyed. Enjoyed. Thank you. This is Unsiloed, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. 